The world of Final Fantasy X is a rich and vibrant place. It features some of the most detailed and diverse characters, delving into race and politics through the telling of their stories. But Spirit itself also comes into play, as it has so much personality thanks to its culture that's just heaped in history. And as you traverse through the world, you get to see that history firsthand. It tells the story of legendary battles that were fought in centuries past, and prominent figures are displayed across the land in ways that are designed to pique your curiosity as players. But they are also there to foreshadow and provide the player with context for the sense of reverence citizens have for the establishment. Lord Mihen serves as a perfect example of this. After leaving Luca, a statue of this legendary figure stands tall and proud at the beginning of the aptly named Mihen High Road, honouring his memory as the founder of the Crusaders. This road was named as such because it was literally on higher ground, but also because after being branded a traitor by the Maesters of Yevon, Mihen took the high road by choosing to answer their crimes in Bevel instead of skulking around in the shadows as a fugitive. This was deemed a noble act, and after deliberation, Yevon accepted both the Crusaders and Mihen, later heralding him as a hero. But outside of being a nice ode to history, this also paralleled the journey that Yuna herself would take. Within each temple, statues are also visible of the summoners who were posthumously granted the title of High Summoner, having been successful in their quest to defeat Sin. The first was Unaleska, and she was succeeded by Gandalf, O'Harland, Jochen, and then Braska. We are led to believe that the actions of those High Summoners were righteous and unselfish, to the point that they should be idolised. But, thanks to flashback sequences that were shown to us through the use of spheres and pyreflies, we got to see that these legendary figures were no different from anyone else. They too had fears and doubts, and the paths they each took were ones filled with challenges that tested who they were. Their guardians were also not infallible, and Braska, along with Oren and Jekt, epitomised this. As a trio, they were a ragtag group. You had a disgraced clergyman, a disgraced warrior monk, and a disgraced drunkard. And even though we only got a glimpse of their story, it felt like there was so much depth just waiting to be explored in more detail. In the initial sense, there was no room for this, as Final Fantasy X was planned to be a self-contained entity. But when conversations started about the potential for the world of Final Fantasy X to be expanded, there were numerous angles that would have made sense for exploration. The developers have spoken in the past about how they didn't have a specific plan to create a fully fleshed out follow-up until after they released Eternal Calm alongside Final Fantasy X International. This was a short cinematic sequence thrown in as fan service, and what we ended up with was something that served as a more definitive conclusion to Final Fantasy X, while giving us a glimpse of what the future looked like. It took place two years after the events of the main game, and showed how Yuna was attempting to move on with her life. But after Riku discovered and then showed her an ancient sphere that contained someone who had an uncanny resemblance to Tidus, we saw Yuna decide to embark on a new quest. Such was the fan response upon the release of this short cinematic that the development team were taken aback, and it led to them going against the core value of every Final Fantasy game being a self-contained entity as they decided to create the first sequel to a numbered Final Fantasy game, if of course we're ignoring Final Fantasy Legend of the Crystals, which was an animation released in 1994 that served as a sequel to Final Fantasy V. Now, you'd be prudent for thinking that since the Eternal Calm introduced a brand new story arc for Yuna, thanks to the addition of Shuyin, that Square Enix would have been quite single-minded about what they were going to do next with the franchise after the release of Final Fantasy X. And you'd be right. But there were question marks about what that short cinematic should have been about when they were in the planning stages. The plot we got, which served as a setup for Yuna's quest to find out more about this mysterious sphere, was just one of the options they had available. We also know, for example, that they were exploring a storyline where Riku would have been the main protagonist, and this would have also served as a sequel to the original game had they gone down that route. But perhaps the most interesting option they considered was a prequel storyline that would have focused on the pilgrimage of Braska, Oren, and Jekt. These three characters were given a strong setup within the original game, and even though we only got to see a few key moments from their own pilgrimage, what was shown within Final Fantasy X revealed that there was a lot of personality within the group. Exploring this in more detail would have also allowed the development team to showcase their fall from grace individually, 
while also showing the development of a bond that grew so strong that it saw Oren promise to watch over the children of both Braska and Jekt. The proposed scenario would have taken place approximately 10 years before the main events of Final Fantasy X, and instead of being called Final Fantasy X-2, it would have instead been called Final Fantasy X-0. But even though it made a lot of sense to go down this route based on the strong recognition players have with that group of characters and a yearning to find out more about the trials and tribulations of Braska's pilgrimage, Square Enix decided it would not be a wise decision, but not for the reason that many would expect. Throughout their history, both Square and Square Enix had always attempted to create video games that featured a diverse cast of characters, and within the Final Fantasy franchise, even though the main protagonist was often male, the deuteragonist and tritagonist was often female, and this became an even stronger point once Yoshinori Kitase joined the production staff and started to help with the creation of richer and more fleshed out narratives. It was under his watch that we got characters like Farish Sveritz, Terra Branford, Sela Cher, Tifa Lockhart, Aerith Gainsborough, Renoa Hartilly, and Yuna. But even before that, one thing had always been consistent. There had always been playable female characters, even in the original Final Fantasy game where white mages were positioned as women. So even though a game about Braska's pilgrimage would perhaps make the most sense from the perspective of recognition and would have been an easier sell to the marketing teams and the fanbase, Motomo Toriyama and the rest of the team did not feel as though they could justify making a game that featured an all-male cast of characters. This information was disclosed by Toriyama, who became the director of Final Fantasy X-2, when he was speaking at E3 2013 during a Square Enix Presents segment that was geared around his upcoming game, Lightning Returns, Final Fantasy XIII. He said, When we were kicking off the production of what would become Final Fantasy X-2, and we were about to work on creating the prologue called The Eternal Calm, which was planned to be a drama scene, there were also discussions about doing a so-called Final Fantasy X-0, which would have involved Braska, Jekt and Oren, but we thought, it's a party of just men, and we felt it just wouldn't have the right kind of flair. Instead, Toriyama revealed that the proposal for Final Fantasy X-0 was what convinced him to do the complete opposite, to have a story focused around Yuna, and to have the playable cast be 100% female. That's why Riku was the one who presented the sphere to Yuna in the Eternal Calm, and Pain was created to complete the trio, coming with her own unique backstory thanks to the Crimson Squad. Toriyama has since shown a penchant for having his narratives focused around strong female characters, with Lightning and Sarah serving as two prominent leads throughout the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy alongside Noel in the second part, and if he were to still be involved with anything related to Final Fantasy X moving forward, his stance would be unlikely to change about creating a game based around three men. But if someone else were to be given the reins instead, as he's rather wrapped up with the Final Fantasy VII remake, the potential for Final Fantasy X would still be there, after all, Final Fantasy XV was a game focused on a party of all men, and it was incredibly successful. Likewise, a sensible option for Square Enix could be to commission a freelancer such as Kazushige Nojima, or someone he vouches for, to write a brand new novel. This was a route Square Enix took to expand the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, with the lateral biography Turks The Kids Are Alright releasing as a standalone novel in 2011, after they had also released a ton of other written works around the release of Advent Children. This approach was also used with Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy XV. Toriyama commissioned Jun Aishima to work on four novels that surrounded the release of both Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy XIII II, and in more recent times, Luminous Productions commissioned Aishima to write Final Fantasy XV Dawn of the Future after it became known that the planned downloadable content would no longer be releasing in the announced format. This seems like perhaps the most sensible option, and it could also be used to try and keep fans engaged as they wait for the almost inevitable release of Final Fantasy X-3 later down the line. Either way, we hope that Square Enix can come up with some way to further explore the pilgrimage of Braska, Oren, and Jekt in the future, as their individual stories are so special. You only have to look at how popular our video has been about the story of Oren to see that people cherish him as a character, I'm sure fans of Final Fantasy X would love to learn more about what happened in Spira's past. On that note though, are you still holding out hope that Final Fantasy X-0 may exist somewhere down the line as either a game or some kind of other format? Be sure to let us know in the comments below, and if you enjoy this brief look into the situation around why Final Fantasy X-0 was never made, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. A big thanks to all our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, and of course, a big thanks to all of you for watching this video. 
Hope to see you all again soon for more final fantasy goodness.